Hey guys, Nolo here. No Man's Sky has had a long and crazy history since its infamous launch. In this video, I'm going to go through this iceberg chart I made, starting with some well-known facts and going more and more obscure as we go. I know this trend of videos died about two years ago, but I was shocked when I realized that no one had ever made one of No Man's Sky. This game has so much lore as well as in real life history that I feel like should be mentioned in one of these kind of videos. So without further ado, let's get started. Big spoiler warning for major plot points in the story as well as minor lore details. Tier 1, Above Water. First Spawn. The Gek First Spawn was an ancient empire. Don't let these cute little buggers fool you. They were expansionistic, militaristic, and very reminiscent of certain real world governments. Whoa, 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 hey! They enslaved the Korvax and they discriminated even against their own people, labeling some as low spawn. Though they were eventually eradicated, there are still NPCs in the game that suggest there are still remnants of the first spawn in the universe. A few interesting lore nuggets are that the first spawn did not believe the Atlas was real. One of the final verses of the script of Gek reads, Every Corvax will be put down. Their appeals to their false and non-existent atlas are mere superstition found through despair. They are in vain. Also interesting are their views on the galaxy. Another quote. This galaxy is vast, but it is knowable, and it can be conquered. It shall be subjugated. The rising tide of the first spawn will sweep away any that oppose it. We do know that these plans ultimately failed but we have yet to know if future events could make them a force to be reckoned with, for example, in a future update. World of Glass In No Man's Sky lore, the World of Glass is a mysterious dimension serving as a repository for important information and memory. The Sentinels aim to save the universe and all life forms by transferring data from the dying Atlas's RAM memory into this ethereal realm, acting sort of like a hard drive. However, this plan overlooks the physical destruction of the Atlas's hardware, so it doesn't matter how much storage and how much data you back up, if the computer itself is gone, everything in it is also gone. Unless they can get this storage room physically away from the Atlas and its impending doom. Another theory that I think is even more plausible is a really fascinating thought that Kanaju had in this one video he posted. Make sure to check it out after this one. He has some interesting thoughts about nested simulations, and I suggest you check it out because I didn't even think about what he came up with. And it's possible that's what the game has planned in its lore, so we have no way of knowing yet. Currently inaccessible in the game, the World of Glass holds large significance in the Sentinel lore, suggesting that a future update may grant players access to its endless glass hall. Themes of glass permeate Sentinel's existence. When they're destroyed, they drop salvaged glass, they use the world of glass for instant teleportation across the cosmos, and the connection between glass, sand, and silicon is an interesting one, showing that these processes may be hardware based as opposed to merely software within the simulation. Triad of Races Although the game boasts over 18 quintillion possible planets, many people question, especially on launch, why there's only three main races that govern the star. The lore has an explanation or a cop-out depending on how you look at it. In the lore of No Man's Sky, the simulated universe went through different versions of millions of different races, histories, traits. However, as the Atlas became older and more corrupted, new versions became more and more similar to each other. This led to three main archetypes forming and repeating. Corvax, Gek, Viking. Corvax, Gek, Viking. I personally would have loved to have seen procedural races where there's like a million different races throughout the galaxy. But we have these three, main ones at least. And we also have the Travelers and the Anomalies, but that's a different story. 16, 16, 16. The number 16 is woven throughout the story and inner workings of No Man's Sky. Here are just some of the ways that number 16 has significance. Firstly, the number of possible planets in the game is equal to the maximum number of an unsigned 64-bit integer. It means 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, which is equal to 16 to the 16th power. Think about that. Part of this is due to how data is often processed in bytes and hexadecimal, and this number based in 16 is something that the Atlas seems to be very aware of and very obsessed with. Secondly, even the glyph addresses are in hex as well, meaning that there are 16 glyphs that we use to locate ourselves in the galaxies and to travel among stars. Thirdly, the game released in 2016. Fourthly, in the Waking Titan lore, which I'm going to cover shortly. Loop 16 was a military experiment to create a simulated universe, which it was the 16th version of this simulation that became sentient and led to the universe of No Man's Sky. Fifthly, 16 is also the number of minutes left until the simulation crashes and the Atlas dies. It is hinted that in the reality that the physical Atlas hardware exists is 16 minutes away from being torn apart by a black hole. 
It is unknown whether it's because of a time difference inside the simulation or simply an Atlas error, but there's not obviously 16 minutes left in the game. When you play, you can play for however long you like, but we have yet to know if there's any implications in further updates that this is in reference to. Waypoint Update no Man's Sky Waypoint was an update that released alongside the game's launch on Nintendo Switch. It is on this list because it causes a big stir in the community. A vocal minority of longtime players felt betrayed as you can no longer install tech into both of your inventories at once. You used to be able to put it in general and in tech. Removing the potential of huge buffs, negating hours and hours of grinding for many players. And in response to these people, many other people criticized those who stopped playing for being Fairweather fans. It got pretty vile, I'm not gonna lie. In the time since, Hello Games has added supercharged tech slots, which don't get us back to 100% pre-waypoint, but it's a decent middle ground. I just need a buff to the jetpack upgrades because I sorely miss how long we used to be able to use our jetpacks. Second tier, Shallow Water, R2-D2 in No Man's Sky. Number 19, Mouse in Baked Beans. This refers to a fighter ship part that's in the game that has a droid that looks awfully similar to the astromechs of the Star Wars universe and the community lovingly calls these R2-D2s, even though the shape is obviously different to avoid any lawsuits from Lucasfilm. I just wish that these actually moved and maybe even got out to repair your ship in battle. I think that would be cool as like an optional upgrade, don't you think? The Abyss. This mysterious entity was first introduced in 2018's Abyss update. Throughout the years, both her lore significance and importance have been revealed. Through lore revealed in the Sentinel update, we learned that this mysterious being that had been poisoning the oceans of the universe was originally the AI in the center of Korvax Prime, the homeworld of said mechanical ray. In those days she was known as the Atlantid and Void Mother. After the first spawn destroyed the Korvax home planet, she somehow survived and is now known as the Abyss, sowing dissent and corruption in the shadow. The recent Interceptor update expanded on her lore even further, adding Atlantidim Atlantidium, <laughs> sorry, adding Atlantidium, a reference to how she used to be called, and the carapaces of an unknown robot race invoke her name, Spooky. These robots are known now as the Autophages, but we have yet to know if they were going to be playable characters in the future, or even NPCs that we have to battle against. Future Nello here. Echoes dropped and we know now for certain that the Autophages are a new race. They're not an enemy race, sadly, but... Yeah, I recorded all this stuff before Echoes dropped, so that's my bad. Back to the vid. Aarons. Okay, let's take a roll here. Hey, Aaron, where are you? Where is A. Aaron right now? The name Aarons was what Sentinels were originally called up until they returned after the fall of Corvax Prime. The name at first seemed to be like an aerospace related term to me, but upon further research, it turns out the name is actually Welsh in origin. There is a river in Wales named Aeron, which allegedly means Queen of Brightness. Perhaps we will soon meet this Queen of the Sentinel Hive. They do seem to have a hive mind, so this would be an interesting direction for them to take the lore. I wouldn't be surprised to be honest. This game is chock full of mythological names, Artemis, Apollo, etc. And Hello Games is based in the British Isles, so I wouldn't be surprised if they integrated some Welsh references in there. And if this is an actual intentional reference, it's even possible that this queen that it's mentioning might even be the abyss herself, and these corrupted sentinels are actually just obeying their original master. Something to think about. I might be reaching a little bit with this one. Hello Games Offices Flood. This entry would have been further down the list, but thanks to Internet Historian's great video, it has become pretty common knowledge. On Christmas Eve of 2013, disaster struck when severe storms caused flooding in the town of Guildford, where Hello Games headquarters is located. The office, near the River Way, was quickly inundated with water that seeped through its walls. The flooding happened so suddenly that there was little time to salvage anything before the water levels rose. The employees and their friends who gathered at the office made efforts to move equipment and personal belongings to cars, but even the cars ended up flooded. After the waters receded, the Hello Games team returned to the office on Christmas morning to assess the damage. Many of their possessions, including computers, TVs, and personal items, were ruined. Despite this devastation, Hello Games had backups of their work which allowed them to restart their projects, including No Man's Sky, which was being developed at the time. To this day, this is the narrative that the media received from Hello Games, that they didn't lose any progress on No Man's Sky's development. But many think that this was only stated to assure the public that No Man's Sky would be in good state at launch, and we all know how that went. It might have been that they lost a lot of progress and they were not honest about it. 
God knows that there was many things promised that were not delivered upon. There's no way of knowing until we get an actual source on this claim though, so take that with a grain of salt. Anywho, speaking of pre-launch history, our next entry is Aurea 5 and the E3 2014 trailer. Aurea 5 was that planet that they showed in the pre-release trailer at E3 2014, two years before the release. This planet was beautiful and showed off herding behaviors, something that wouldn't be added to the game until a later update. And part of the deception that hurt many gamers at the time was that these planets were touted to be just randomly found within the game. And in reality, data miners later found files of these planets just being scripted assets and not actually from some old build of the game. Third tier, Deeper Water, Ariadne and Sus. Starting November 2019, we got two seasons of dedicated weekend missions with their own lore. Most of these missions involved repairing breaches in reality with certain materials caused by a mysterious abyss. These missions were spearheaded by the NPCs in the Anomaly, led by Ariadne. After almost a year of weekly story snippets, it culminated in an eerie reveal. Ariadne was not who they claimed they were. They were a murderous imposter. Little by little, NPCs disappeared from the Anomaly until No Man's Sky 3.0 Origins dropped. A massive and beautiful update to the game. With this, all the NPCs were back in their places. But were they really? Are these really the original NPCs back? Or are they all imposters? Something to think about. Heridium Pillars. This entry is truly for the OGs among you. If you remember this, you deserve a medal for having stuck with this game through thick and thin. These giant blue pillars used to be scattered all over the landscapes. And different metals generated differently. For example, iridium used to form arches, other metals like aluminum were generated in craters. After the huge terrain changes that the next update brought, metals now generated flush with the terrain. I don't know if they did this for realism, because I don't really remember running into a giant glob of silver in my last hike, but the original metal deposits definitely had their distinct charm that I kinda miss. Speaking of things I miss, Plutonium and Thamium 9. Another thing only OGs will remember is landing on a planet without having a good stockpile of plutonium. You used to need a good amount of the stuff to be able to even take off from a planet. Stack sizes back then were very limited, so you might have like 200 in one slot and that would be all used up to charge up your thrusters. You'd often be stranded looking for those giant red crystals. Funnily enough, the crystals are still in the game, they're just no longer launch fuel, now they're just condensed carbon. The plants that we now call oxygen used to give us thamium 9. You could use those to recharge your life support and charge your pulse drive. Stuff was in the asteroids too. Next, remove both of these elements. Although, fun fact, thamium can still be found in planet atmosphere, although only as flavor text. Simpler time. I definitely have nostalgia for those times in No Man's Sky. I went back and I've played a few older versions and it's very difficult to get back into now because of all the improvements we've had in gameplay loops and accessibility. There is a certain vibe that I miss in No Man's Sky. Waking Titan. Waking Titan was a multi-season ARG that Hello Games hired a company to make for them to hype up the yet to be released Atlas Rises and Next updates. For more info on what an ARG is and what this was all about, I made a more in-depth video which I'll link to right here. The Atlas's True Identity. Spoilers here for the whole extensive Waking Titan. In said ARG we met a character played by a real actress named Emily and whose consciousness is eventually revealed to be trapped in a computer simulation. And it's very strongly hinted that this is Loop 16. This is the Atlas in its infancy. If so, all we have thought about the Atlas being some unfeeling, uncaring deity goes out the window, as from the beginning they were imbued with a human personality, if this theory is to be believed. I'm actually kind of stoked that these recent updates have been including ARG elements to them because I kind of miss that. I'm not gonna lie, it doesn't feel the same as back then, it's probably because they're doing it in-house this time instead of hiring Allison Smith, but definitely interesting. Speaking of the ARG, the next entry in this level is the Atlas Pass V4. Atlas Pass 1 through 3 are all in-game item, but the V4 Pass is a physical card that was given out to 10,000 people who participated in Waking Titan July of 2017. I'm super happy to be among those who got this, albeit glorified business card, but it's still a nice memento of that participation we had in those days. Missing Feature List. This entry refers to a big list compiled around the time the game launched, with all the features that were mentioned or shown before launch, but weren't actually in the game when it came out. Funnily enough, a vast majority of these features have not only made it into the game, there's dozens of other features that were never promised that also made it into the game. Me personally, 
I would have liked more of a focus on exploration throughout the years, and that hasn't been the focus in a long while. But you won't find me complaining about the tons of free content that we've gotten over 7 years. I love this game, don't get me wrong, I'm still allowed an opinion, and I still wish that they would remember those who started with this game and love the exploration aspect. Yes, these new features bring hype and new players to the game, but I would love another origin style update or something even deeper. I would love a whole overhaul to how variety is spread throughout the universe. I know it's easier said than done, but okay, rant over. It's just something I've been wanting for so long. And while we're on the topic of the launch, the next entry is launch day people meet up. Two people met up on launch day in the game. People had the impression, understandably, that you would be able to see each other through multiplayer. So two players spawned close enough to each other and managed to find each other and actually stand in the exact same spot on a planet. Yet they couldn't see each other. The game didn't have multiplayer on launch. Do we ever get to see ourselves? Uh, no. You don't see yourself, so the only way for you to know what you look like is for somebody else to, you know, to see you. Can you run into other people, other players on the game? Yes, but the chances of that are incredibly rare, just because of the size of what we're building. Leading up to release, there was never a definitive communication that multiplayer was not yet in the game. To give credit, Sean did say, To be super clear, No Man's Sky is not a multiplayer game. Please don't go in looking for that experience. I'm not here to excuse any shitty communication or misleading marketing leading up to launch. It was just such a letdown for countless millions of people, and I do not fault anyone for being felt like they were deceived. It's been seven years, I am over this already, but I know a lot of people still have a sore spot and will never be able to get into No Man's Sky because of the way they felt lied to. So, if you watch my content and you don't play No Man's Sky, I understand if you don't want to play No Man's Sky. More power to you. Tier 4 Darkest Depths Mr. Robot About two months after the infamous launch of the game, the official Hello Games Twitter account legit tweeted this, No Man's Sky was a mistake. Although the media was quick to report that it was a disgruntled employee, it turned out that Hello Games Twitter account had been hacked through an insecure LinkedIn account. Sean confirmed this via tweet saying, Server hacked, we're binging Mr. Robot episodes as quickly as we can looking for answers. This prompted the subreddit No Man's Sky the game, which had imploded into an empty and toxic hellhole. It turned into a Mr. Robot subreddit, covering the show instead of the game. Strange times indeed. If you remember this, you deserve a veteran's medal, not gonna lie. Beacon addresses. Before portals worked, before you could request the address of a planet, before we had the little glyph tag and screenshots, the only way you could know where in the galaxy you were was placing down a beacon. What looks like random numbers and letters is actually the coordinates of what system you're in in the galaxy. Although this address could not be inputted into any portal, a few geniuses made websites like the Pilgrim Star map where you could orient yourself and you could like navigate to places indirectly just like they would tell you, okay, look at the center of the galaxy and then look to the right a few degrees, warp that way for 10,000 light years and you'll get to wherever you want to go. That's the only way we could get to places that were shared back then. This is how the OG hubs formed like the Galactic Hub, Etark Hub, as well as others. You youngins don't know how easy you have it nowadays. All you gotta do is boop boop boop, you put in some glyphs, and you're in a beautiful planet. That's not how it used to be. Someone would find Diplos, and they're like, hey guys, I found Diplos, this is the planet here. And you would say, okay, let me put down a beacon, let me write down this code and type it into this website, and then it'll tell me what direction I have to look in to warp millions and millions of light years to get to it. It's crazy. That's why I thought I would mention that. Hello Games Launch Stream. Many people don't realize that Sean and Grant Duncan, the founders of Hello Games, streamed the game on launch day. There were a few moments that I'm sure would have become memes if the game wasn't pure shit when it came out. What I really want is that like, when you fire at a planet, it to pop up a message. You killed a baby antelope <laughs> <laughs> on Omicron 7 or whatever. Look, I love the vibe and the exploration of the original game, but No Man's Sky was shit when it came out. And this is not an apologetic channel where we try to deny what it was. In 99% of people's opinion, the game was an unfinished mess. Thankfully, over the years, it's become a more polished mess. In a game that I love to play, I love to come back to, I love to make content about. I'll leave a link to the stream down below if you're curious. Guy pays over a grand for No Man's Sky. Before the game came out, about two weeks before, a physical copy somehow got leaked from some game store supplier. The person ended up selling it on eBay, and a guy bought it for over $1,300.
You could have just waited a few days and gotten it for 60. But it was a great insight to be able to see footage and he even reviewed his experience before the game came out. He wasn't overly negative about the game either. He said he was fortunate enough to afford this so it wasn't too much money for him and the hype for the game might have been more in control if maybe more people watch his reviews. It would have brought the hype train a little closer to earth because people would be like, okay, yes, it has its flaws. It's not a complete game yet, but it has promise. But sadly, these reviews, I think, were blocked and people kept being misled into thinking that this was the next coming of the gaming messiah when in reality, it was far from it at the time. Data mining. Throughout the years and countless updates, we've had opportunities to have small sneak peeks into coming updates by digging through the game files. For example, we knew that vehicles would be coming before the trailer for Pathfinder even dropped. Same thing with pets, cosmetic items, as well as other features. As we almost never get any advance notice of anything from Hello Games, many people believe that they leave these files here on purpose to be found, to be able to get a tease without committing to anything like they did at launch and you know how well that went, so. I guess it makes sense why they do this. I just wish we had a little more communication, especially the developer with content creators and with actual players. and have some community feedback. We don't really have that. And when I see games that actually have a relationship between developer and community, it kind of makes me jealous that we don't have that for No Man's Sky. I wish we lived in a dimension where the game came out in a decent state and we had actual communication, not whatever sad excuse of communication we have right now with Hello Game. Variety that we lost. This entry is dedicated to mourning some of the variety that we have lost over the years. Don't get me wrong, we have a decent variety of biomes, colors, plants, creatures, and terrain, but I miss when dead planets used to be able to have water, and moons used to have water. I miss when you could find worlds full of plant life, but there would be no animals. I miss not knowing what planet's terrain was going to look like. We had some pretty interesting and unworldly terrain generation back then. I have no problem with all the new variety necks and origins brought to the game. I just wish that instead of replacing the old with the new, some percentage of the old would have been mixed in with the new, or even like an improved version of the old way. You know what I mean? Why replace the whole color palette and throw out those old colors when you could just make a bigger palette? Is it like a technical limitation of the engine? I have no way of knowing this myself. If you have any insight onto the actual way the game works and why they have such a limited palette, please let me know in the comments below because I'm really curious why we have such a limited color set and limited everything, biome variety. We should have had procedural biomes already, I feel like, but that's enough ranting for me. Back to the list. The original third person model. Before the next update brought actual third person models, data miners found old code of not only the Diplos from the planet of the E3 trailer, they also found a 3D model meant for the third person, a T-posing Joe Danger looking astronaut motherfucker, as well as the Half-Life 2 logo for some reason. Does the game contain any Joe Danger Easter eggs? No, it doesn't, but I feel like we should do that. I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. It's been a while since I've made an in-depth video covering lore or topics like this. I want to keep making content like this in the future. Stay in touch. Stay tuned. Join the Discord server if you like. And you have a wonderful day. This has been Nolo.